Um, again, welcome everyone uh, to the University of Manchester's second new Turing Fellow Spotlights. So we have 50 new fellows starting in October. And um, we will have, uh, this is the second round, so we will have more uh, events scheduled in December and uh, January and February next year. So it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, who is uh, Professor Yuan Chen, who is a professor in Decision Sciences and Business Analytics at the Alliance Manchester Business School. And he will talk about uh, decision analytics using data-driven modeling and evidential reasoning. So I um, would like to uh, welcome Professor Chen to start his talk. Thank you, Sophia. Let me share the screen. Just want to confirm you can see my screen. You can see my slides. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, looks, that looks good. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Sophia, for the introduction. It's a pleasure for me to have this opportunity to present my research. So the title of my presentation today is a Decision Analytics Using Data-Driven Modeling and Evidential Reasoning. So this is the outline for my presentation. I will first introduce the context of my research, decision-making and uncertainty, multiple criteria of decision analysis, decision matrix over belief decision matrix. Then I will briefly introduce my methodological research on evidential reasoning and the belief role-based systems. I will quickly go through a couple of research projects I'm working on or have completed in recent years, if I have time, before the final summary and the further research. So this matrix is a part of everyone's life and all of us have to make decisions every day right from what we eat, what we do, to what research we are going to conduct. In our organization, decision-making can occur at all levels, from operational to managerial to strategic. However, it was reported by IBM Analytics back to a few years ago, one third business leaders frequently make decisions based on information they do not trust or don't have. More than half of the CEOs need to, to do a better job capturing and understanding information in order to make informed decision making decision in businesses. So data-driven decision making is regarded as a fundamental to improve the situation of decision making in practice. So decision analytics is mainly concerned with user structured, quantitative and analytical approaches to promote data-driven and evidence decision-making in business and management. So decision analytics can be seen as an integrated decision-making process with the use of both knowledge-based and the data-based, say, say, intelligence. Knowledge-based intelligence from decision-makers and experts, computational intelligence from machine learning and AI models. So the end of the knowledge-based decision-making, this side, so decision-making, the very, very end, decision-maker make, guesses without prior experience. But very often decision-maker use a prior knowledge and the judgments in the decision-making process. So knowledge-based intelligence involves something like say decision rules, case-based reasoning, basing inference, of course, human biases and the bounded rationality are very common in knowledge-based decision-making. The other side, machine learning and the AI models can be developed purely based on data or predominantly based on data. But of course, a pragmatic understanding of the decision context is important in order to make use of machine learning and AI models in decision support. Also, computational intelligence can inhibit human biases in their decision-making process. So decision analytics aims to combine knowledge-based intelligence and the data-driven intelligence together 
which is Ford, data-driven and the evidence-based decision-making. What is decision-making? If we look at a simple say, case study in our teaching for MSc or for undergraduate students, we assume, okay, we have a three alternatives to invest in a real estate market, basically apartment, office, or warehouse. The annual return and the different economic situation for each alternative can be estimated using data, historical data, for example. So we can estimate the potential returns for all combinations of decisions under the states of the nature, basically the future economic situation in this case. So we have this data under which property are you going to buy? That's a decision making problem. Of course, if it is for sure, the economic situation will become better next year. There's no, there's no issue at all in decision making, right? We pick up say this one, this option, which gives the highest return. But very often we have to make decision under uncertainty. We are not saying, we are not really sure what will happen in the future. So the future is uncertain. So we consider decision making under uncertainty. So uncertainty can be associated with a partial knowledge, uncertain information, unknown future, etc. So the simple decision making problem already involves different considerations. There are even more challenges in applying decision analytics in real world scenario. For example, for risk analysis in containerized supply chain, for example, from Liverpool to Shanghai. So we have to consider different types of risks. And in order to assess the risks comprehensively, both quantitative data and the quantitative information need to be connected from different sources in order to produce the risk matrix. In consumer preference modeling for new product development, also data and the information should be connected from different sources. Also the data can be in different forms with the different skills. For performance modeling and the decision analysis of renewable energies, and uh, very often a hierarchical decision model can be developed. In this hierarchical structure, as you can see from these, say, diagrams, and say the environmental impact can be assessed against different sub-criteria. So basically we consider a set of decision criteria in our hierarchical structure. In multiple criteria decision analysis, we can often construct a decision matrix to support decision analysis. In this decision matrix, each element such as A11 represents the average assessment of alternative one over attribute or say criteria or say basically variable one. Often average numbers are used to assess each alternative or decision criteria. However, it's important to bear in mind that the same average number can be associated with different distributions. For these two continuous distributions, the average is the same. For these two discrete distributions or quality assessment, the average is, is also the same. Although the average is the same, but the distributions capture different types of information. So it means the flow of average can distort everyday decision making in many areas. So simply speaking, the purpose of multiple criteria decision analysis to support the decision making process of identifying the most preferred solution from a set of efficient solutions. If there are only two criteria, for example, safety and the profit in this small case, both for maximization, we can visualize the decision making process. So we have different alternatives in this small case. Obviously the alternative C, basically D and E are better than C on both criteria. So C is a dominated solution in this case. And D and E is better than D on safety while I have the same profit. So D to some extent is also dominated or is a weak efficient solution. Theoretically, we can identify all 
efficient solutions, we can identify the efficient frontier. As a rational decision maker, we always pick up alternatives on the efficient frontier. This case only involves two small sectors, two criteria. If there are more than two criteria, of course, we have to find a way of aggregating information from the criteria to the say, top level, the decision outcome, such as using the simple weighted sum. So back to the flow of averages I discussed say, previously, in the research conducted by myself and some colleagues in the decision and the cognitive sciences research center in the business school, we propose to extend the decision matrix to believe decision matrix. In this belief decision matrix, we use a discrete distribution to capture assessment information for some criteria. So the discrete distribution can represent, of course, the precise numbers. It can also present uncertain information, like probability distributions, also uncertain judgments, even with ignorance. So in the past year, my research has focused mainly on multiple criteria decision analysis, using information from different sources. We consider information representation, inference, and the data analytics. So here is a small say, web search cluster analysis to the titles of my, my, my publications I published in the past decade. So the keywords for my publications include, say, beneath robust say, models, evidential reasoning, also decision making, prediction, an analysis, network, and so on. In decision theory, evidential reasoning has been developed as a generic evidence-based multiple criteria decision analysis approach for formulating decision making problems, updating information from the bottom level criteria to the top level decision outcome, also capture information in different types in order to support decision making. So the idea is very straightforward. We combine information from decision criteria together in order to support the final say, decision outcome. And then mathematically, evidential reasoning is a kind of like, say, generalized probabilistic inference which extends the density the rule and the basic inference. So furthermore, in the past decade, I've been working on the combining the knowledge base with the evidential learning method. So as you can say from this small diagram, so on one side, I explore how to formulate different types of information in the decision-making process, including quantitative information, quantitative data, probability distributions, and then further extend the knowledge base to multiple levels. So we consider a hierarchical decision making the process as well. A simple comparison between the beneath rule and the traditional if then rule, as you can say, for the beneath rule, the consequent part is a discrete distribution. We use a beneath distribution to capture the answer outcome. In this case, the tradition, traditional if then rules are set a case of beneath rules. Probability distributions are also special case of belief structures. So it means we can use a small number of belief rules to capture relationship in a more accurate way. We can also use data to train the parameters for the belief rule base. A dynamic form of belief rules can be formulated some say, like this. We can use this to capture say, uncertain decision outcomes. So the decision outcomes can be subjective in evaluation grades or numerical data or different events or different faults in fault diagnosis. A single layer say, belief rule based model say something like this. So this can represent a transparent and interpretable inference process from input information to the decision outcome, which is represented by a belief distribution. On the other side, I have been working on different inference mechanisms, including the classic identical self theory of evidence to a data reasoning, also some other reasoning models in order to combine information together. 
So the methodology can be formulated mathematically by the three robots matrix, something like this. And then we can say formulate the whole model using the mathematical form within constraints of parameters. Also the input and the outputs can be represented by belief distributions. We combine these two sides and the model based inference engine together and the whole model represents a belief world based inference methodology using a potential vision. If the output is represented by the, by the distribution, so we can easily capture uncertain outputs in decision analysis. Something like say, the minimum maximum or average utilities in decision analysis. We can further use data to train the models. The initial belief rules can be constructed using expert models or historical data. We can further use the data to train the parameter in order to make the model more accurate. Okay. So next I'm going to provide a very brief overview of three projects. Basically, say two of them I completed in the in the past years, and I say the last one basically is an ongoing project. So the first project is about the containerized supply chain risk analysis. Of course, containerized supply chain plays a very important role in global economic prosperity. Approximately 90% of water trade is achieved in shipping say, containers. So in this project, we evaluate and prioritize different types of risks for mitigation strategies. So we consider the physical flow for the whole supply chain, say from supplier side to import side. At each stage of this whole supply chain, we have to consider different types of risks. Like a maritime transportation, we have to consider risk, like say fire and explosion, condition, and these type of risks. So data needed to be collected basically from different sources, from experts, from historical records, in order to evaluate these risks. And then we combine information together in order to prioritize the risks for mitigation strategies. So we used the methods we developed, let's say, so including evidential reasoning and the belief role-based models. So the second project basically is to formulate a relationship between product profile and the customer rating in new product development. So in this case, data are also collected from different sources, from analysts, also from say, consumers, from surveys, also from experiments. It is what's mentioned that the target for prediction for this project is actually distri distributed customer liking, not a number, because customers can have very divided preferences for some projects. So we do not predict the average consumer say, liking, we predict the distribution. So typical machine not learning models cannot be used directly for this distributed distribution. As we discussed previously, we use a, I'd say, basically a belief structure to capture the output for our model. So we can capture this distributed customer icon for this project. So the third project basically is an ongoing KTP knowledge transport project with a forensic testing company. So the main focus of this project is to use data from different sources including analytic testing data from health samples, expert reports, questionnaires from drug users for substance misuse assessment. So we use say, data in different forms and also in different scales in order to support the decision making in the court. So we also use say, a set of different say, machine learning models plus raw based models to predict the the drug usage for certain patients or clients in this case. Okay, so in this short presentation, I briefly talk about my say, methodical research and also a couple of research projects in the context of decision analytics. In this years, I focus a bit more on analyze and formulating social influence decision making, including say, water terrain, 
decision say vaccination decision making in the current context. So we aim to combine social network analysis together with a multiple quality analysis. We also focus a bit more on using data science, AI models in decision support under analytics. I would be very interested in say why the research collaboration and also more applications of data and the decision analytics in different areas. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Johan, for uh, keeping the time as well. Uh, so we have um, about um, actually seven minutes so for questions. So I would like to open the floor. Thank you. Um, so any questions? Questions? Um, so uh, I'll, I'll, um, I'll ask um, a question because I come from a, a different field and I'm working also on uncertainty, um, but from textual points of view. So my question is, you mentioned about qualitative and quantitative data. Uh, to what extent, I mean, how do you um, envisage any problems when you're trying to integrate different types of data to detect the decision making? What are the challenges, the main challenges? Yeah, this is a very good question. Thank you, Sophia. And they, let me just put the question in a context. So basically, the one, the first project I in, introduced. So for this project, basically, you want to prioritize risks for mitigation because of resources and money are always limited. So we can, cannot mitigate all the risks in container nice chain. So in this case, basically we collect the data and say one source quantitative data. We know like say a fire explosion condition, how many times they happened in the past for certain say, say, say supply chain company or say for certain say, like say new report. So quantitative data and the frequency analysis, something like that. On the other hand, say if we also collect data from experts or say managers or say, say staff for a containership. So basically the, the provide say subject of data, like say from two dimensions, the negative hit, how likely you think say fire will say may say happen in a containership. So they provide different subject of evaluation grades and also the potential consequence. In case a fire happens in a containership, what mitigation strategies you have and say, what, what, what would what be the potential consequence? Because the potential consequence before say something happened, we don't know the potential consequence. So that data, the potential consequence is also evaluated by experts. So in this case, we have to combine quantitative data and the judgments, say prior knowledge from experts together in order to approve produce a ranking of, of different say, risks. So basically in that case, say, the main challenge was that say, we say basically we decide the relative, relative importance of different say, information sources and also how to combine these two different types of information together. That was the main challenge for this say, particular research. So uh, yeah, that's very, that's very interesting. So, uh, I mean, any other questions? We have uh, four minutes. Okay, I'll ask another one because nobody <laughs> is asking. Maybe if there's any questions, it's good to have a you know discussion. So um, uh, again, this has to do with the priors that you are using in the different knowledge sources. Uh, in a kind of belief, if you have a kind of belief and system, um, I mean, how, to what extent uh, you are using existing knowledge sources as, as priors and what kind of difficulties you are encountering? Again, this is a very insightful question. And I say in beneath rule-based models, it's, it's pretty hard to create the initial rules because compared with the traditional rules, we have the uncertain upwards here. Let me say more to this. And this one, so we have a, num a number of the different say, parameters, like the relative importance of different rules, and also the relative importance of different inputs, and also the beneath degrees 
which are associated with different outcomes. So normally we can say, we, in the first instance, we can formulate rules from experts, like a risk assessment. We can create information from experts, say construct the initial rules. And then we can also say, say generate rules randomly, or we generate rules from data. And once we have more, say, data samples, we can further train the parameters and make the rule, say, basically more useful or more accurate in capture relationship. So rule-based model, in my understanding, essentially we consider different scenarios for the whole input space. We decompose the whole input space to smaller, say, areas, and then we consider local knowledge within a small area. That's the, that's the idea, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. A uh, couple of minutes, if there is any other question. Well, if not, I would like to thank the speaker for a very nice talk, an excellent talk. Um, thank you again for your time. So um, it's time now to um, introduce our uh, second uh, speaker for today's uh, event. And uh, this is um, Matthew Thorpe, uh, Matt, uh, Matt, sorry, Matt Thorpe, who is a senior lecturer in applied mathematics, who is going to be talking to us about large data limits in semi-supervised learning. So looking forward to this. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I actually slightly extended the scope of my talk to include some other work as well, but it's kind of mostly focused on uh, large data um, limits. Oh. Okay, uh, right. Okay, so I guess I just to kind of introduce myself. So actually, I'm a lecturer, not a senior lecturer um, in applied okay. mathematics, um, but thank you for the promotion. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I previously was a research fellow in Cambridge, uh, which actually is where I'm at the moment. I'm attending the, um, the Mathematics of Deep Learning program here at the Isaac Newton Institute. Um, for that, I did a, a postdoc in the US at Carnegie Mellon University, and my PhD originally comes from the University of Warwick. So sort of broadly speaking, I kind of have sort of three areas of interest. Um, so I'm interested in, in discrete to continuum variational limits in sort of graph-based uh, learning. Um, I'm interested in, in graph neural networks, and particularly sort of kind of the connections with sort of PDEs. And I'm interested in sort of um, optimal transport um, type distances. And of course, I'm interested in all the sort of applications that come along with, with all these um, areas. Okay, so I've kind of written down a few of the projects I've been involved in recently. The ones highlighted in red are the ones I'm going to kind of touch on today. So, I mean, typically, you know, the large data limit to uh, graph based learning. So we set up some sort of variational problem um, on a graph, and then we're looking at what happens as the number of nodes that graph goes off to infinity. And this is in a sort of a variety of contexts. So it could be sort of semi-supervised learning, it could be clustering, it could be fully sort of um, fully supervised. Um, and you know, and the applications could be more geared towards imaging or you know a range of scenarios. Um, in neural networks, I'm kind of interested in what happens as you get sort of deeper networks. Um, so in particular, making the connections between a, sort of a very deep network and something like an ODE um, system, and trying to use this to design sort of new, um, new architectures. So more recently, I've been trying to kind of combine this with this sort of graph-based learning to design um, sort of graph-based neural network um, uh, schemes. Getting yeah, and find sort of optimal transport. This is something that you maybe you've never heard this before, maybe you know a lot about this. Um, if you've never heard this before, this is just a way of defining distance, which is particularly sort of useful in, um, in imaging. Um, there's a few disadvantages, but we can kind of find our way, uh, circumnavigate these uh, disadvantages. And okay, there's some sort of very nice sort of application. So an application I won't talk about is something like COVID-19 classification on um, X-rays. Um, Okay, so part one is, is kind of this graph-based uh, learning. Um, okay, so at a high level, what do we have? So we have a set of feature vectors, so these live in some Euclidean space, and we have a subset of labels. Okay, and the aim is to try and find labels for the unlabeled feature vectors. I think so we do this in a, a graph-based setting, which gives us like a geometry. Okay, so the graph consists of nodes, which are just the feature vectors, and then the weights are um, some measure of similarity between feature vectors. 
Okay, so we, we sort of say, okay, the weight is very big. If we think of Xi and Xj as being very similar, or you know, the weight's approximately zero if it's very dissimilar. Okay, so we're we're given these sort of labels. So I've just assumed that the first m feature vectors are labeled. Um, okay, and I'm going to assume that they're sort of categorical uh, labels. So we have k different classes, and we want to put um, put each each feature vector in one of these k classes. So the assumption then is that these feature vectors should have similar labels, which of course is sort of very reasonable. Okay, so the problem is we're given our feature vectors, we're given a subset of labels, and we want to find the best function that sort of agrees with the labels. And then it would use that to predict what, what label we should give the unlabeled uh, feature vectors. Um, okay, so the classical kind of approach for this would be do something like regression, right? So one would look at minimizing the gradient subject to this constraint. So, because this isn't really taking advantage of the fact that this is a semi supervised learning problem. So this is kind of just a very nice example uh, by one of my collaborators. So let's imagine we have only two. Um, two labels. We have a red label and we have a blue label. And now I want to divide my state space up into this, into two, um, into these regions. So of course, like the most natural thing to do is just to put a line down the middle, anything to the left is red, anything to the right is blue. Now you give me unlabeled feature vectors, right? And you can see if I apply this decision rule, it's not really a very good solution, right? So I've kind of, I haven't learned my geometry. So a much better rule will be to move the line over here. And then, okay, you can see this is probably a much better answer. Okay, so this is kind of what the semi-supervised learning setting, you know, philosophically, what we kind of hope to take advantage of. Okay, so mathematically, the way we sort of do this is to look at minimizing an, an energy. So the energy we look at minimizing is the following. So we're looking for the function Fn, which, Okay, so we, we define this energy as being the pairwise difference to some pth power weighted by the edge weights. So what this says is if we're looking at minimizing this energy, then if two feature vectors xi and xj are similar, that will mean that w i j has to be very big. So this means then that f and xi minus f and xj should be very small. So in some sense, we're encoding smoothness. Okay, so this is the variational problem, which I'll talk about for a little bit. Um, okay, and so then we get to the actual classification by just looking at the, um, I think looking at the label that's, that's closest to the, to the function Fn, so just thresholding. Um, I'll, I'll try and sort of skip over this a little bit because I don't want to go too much into the mathematics. But essentially, if one scales this energy the right way, and if one scales the edge weights in the right way, one gets a kind of a continuum model, which, which um, depends on the density of the data. Okay, and there's some various sort of assumptions that one needs. So one has to scale the graph so that the graph stays connected. Um, but these kind of all to get sort of technical details. Okay, this this is there's some maths on this page, but I think it's quite interesting um, to go over, and it, it perhaps gives you something that you wouldn't necessarily expect, um, particularly maybe for mathematicians. Um, so one thing you can look at is that if you want to minimize this energy here on a continuum domain, well, there's, there's various sort of regularity results, which essentially mean that if P is sufficiently big, so this means bigger than dimension of the space, then F has to be continuous, and then it makes sense to have pointwise constraints. And um, when P is not very big, you can have discontinuities. If you have discontinuities, it kind of means if you only have finitely many uh, constraints or finitely many labels, then you, um, it, it essentially it's not a well-posed problem. Okay, and one would then expect that P being bigger than D is kind of enough. It turns out this isn't correct, and we can kind of see this through like a very simple example. So if I say, let's, ha let's say we have to label uh, one on the first feature vector and label sort of zero everywhere else. So this is kind of a spike. So this is kind of a, a bad thing, right? Because it means that we're not very smooth. Uh, we're not sort of interpolating between our feature vectors very well. So this should have very high energy. Once we kind of put this into our energy, essentially, you know, just to kind of cut to the chase, what we actually find is that this energy can go to zero if epsilon is too big. 
right? So this kind of means there's a sort of nice interplay between the sort of the scaling on the on the graph and whether or not we get a, a sort of like a smooth interpolation between labels. Okay, and this is, you know, I'll just flash this theorem up. Essentially, this theorem is, is kind of sharp. It gives the two regimes where we either um, we either are in a well-posed regime if our if our sort of scaling in the graph is is not too big, and we're in this sort of ill-posed regime if we're if we're if the scaling in the graph is too big. Okay, to kind of show you what's going on. So this is an example where we only have two labels. So we have a label up here and we have a label up here um, and we've chosen okay, P equals four in our energy and we've worked out what the continuum kind of um, minimizer is. And we get this sort of nice, um, you know, smooth sort of interpolation between the two labels. Okay, so here I've done the same um, thing, but now I've done this with data points. So this is, you know, around about a thousand data points. And you can see, you know, these two, you, know, you can kind of believe that this, um, finite data problem is kind of approximating this continuum data problem. And this is weird, so epsilon is the scaling on the graph. This is a scaling on the graph that's fairly small. If I increase my sort of scaling, if I increase my epsilon, so I sort of look at sort of essentially um, my graph connectivity becomes bigger and bigger, and I zoom in to sort of around where one of these constraints are, what you can see is you get um, increasing, increasingly you get kind of more discontinuous. So your function gets less smooth. And this kind of really shows you how you're going from kind of like a well post case over here, to like an ill post case over here. Okay, so this is bad. So how do we, do we sort it out? So there's kind of two things we can, we can do. So one thing is we can increase the number of labels that we have. So everything I kind of showed you before is true for when you fix the number of labels, um, but you take the number of unlabeled points off to infinity. And what we can show is that if one has um, at least this many labels, then you should be in a well-posed regime and you're okay, right? So your, your labeling the function is going to be sort of nice and smooth. The second thing you can do is look at correcting the bias. So once you come to like thresholding, so you can see here like an extreme case where this is, this is the minimizer um, for a particular problem where we've uh, essentially got you know, a spike here, which is which one of the constraints, a spike here, satisfying the other constraint. Because what we would actually do in practice is we would threshold. So you can see if we threshold through one of the spikes, then basically everything gets associated to one label, not the other. But if we can kind of make sure that this plane is in the right place, then maybe we have some hope. And actually this, this sort of idea led to kind of a, uh, an algorithm which we, call, which we call Poisson learning. And this actually had um, much, much better results. And this essentially was just from correcting the bias that we got from the, from the previous problem. So I can kind of just now show you some results. And of course, you know, these results all work uh, very well. So the PLAS learning, this is the, the kind of the original problem which I showed you. And we're looking at, so this is the MNIST data dataset, which is essentially a toy data set. We're looking at one label per class. There are 10 classes because the MNIST data set is um, handwritten digits, uh, one to 10. So on a data set with one class, the PLAS learning gets about 16% accuracy. So chance will be 10% accuracy. So it's just slightly better than chance, but not much better. Right. On the other hand, just correcting for the bias, right, this brings you up to already up to about 90% accuracy. Right. So, and then because you know, we tried, we compared with a whole range of other sort of semi supervised learning algorithms. And, you know, you can see we, we beat them all as long as we have, you know, in the regime where we have very, very few labels. So, you know, only sort of, you know, what, 50 labels per class is the most we, most we did. Similar story in other data sets. So there's the fa fashion MNIST data set, um, WebKB. These are kind of considered slightly harder problems. Um, and it's kind of the same story that, you know, our, our corrected bias algorithm does, in most cases, significantly better. Um, you'll notice, of course, as you get more and more labels, the gap closes. And this is really because our algorithm is kind of designed for the low labeling rate uh, regime. Okay. So I went through that very quickly. Okay, this now onto this kind of second part. This is kind of the optimal transport uh, part. So first of all, I kind of want to motivate um, 
optimal transport. So let's say we want to compare the distance between two images. And my images are a red ball and a blue ball. So the first thing you can probably do is think, well, let's use like a Euclidean type distance. So in Euclidean type distance, you take one image, you put the other image um, over the top of it, and you just subtract them. Okay, and then you look at, you know, what, what's the, essentially in this case, what's the area left? So of course, between these two balls here, right, the, the Euclidean distance between the two balls, it's just going to be you know, the red area plus the blue area. Okay, so this is maybe okay when the balls are overlapping, but you can kind of see once the balls have moved apart, we, then the, uh, the Euclidean distance is going to be constant. It's just going to be twice the volume of the balls. And in particular, there's no gradient. So if we want to optimize this, say we want to move the blue ball in the direction of the red ball, well, we have zero gradient. So no gradient descent method is going to work in this sort of Euclidean setting. Um, a more sort of physically accurate model is kind of the Lagrangian viewpoint. So the Lagrangian viewpoint says, okay, how far do we have to move the blue ball to get to the red ball? So in this case, of course, right, how we move will be to sort of shift everything to the to the left. Okay, and then so the so the, the Lagrangian distance, or this will be the optimal transport distance, is going to be the cost of uh, essentially this vector field which pushes forwards the, the blue ball into the red ball. Okay, so I mean, I, I won't sort of spend too long explaining kind of you know, what the fuzzy sign distance is, but essentially it's the picture on the previous slide. So if we have, now our images are going to be measures, so maybe we have a measure nu and we have a measure nu, and then we have some map T, which deforms mu into nu. Okay, so this notation here just means that mu is rearranged and now it's the measure nu. And then we look at paying the cost of transporting from X to T of X. Okay, and so you think of this as, you know, we want to move mass uh, mu of x from x to t of x, and the cost we pay is proportional to the square distance. Um, okay, so this is kind of very nice. So as you can see from the previous slide, you know, we kind of have, you know, it's, such, it's a Lagrangian uh, model, which is often more physically reasonable. It's fairly actually simple to understand kind of what's actually going on, even if the mathematics kind of hides this a little bit. Um, one can think of this as just moving, well, this, is, this distance was first proposed by Monge, who kind of did this in the context of moving dirt from a trench to a wall. So he wanted to know if I dig a hole and I want to build a wall, where should I move the, the dirt from my hole to the, to the wall? So this, I think, gives it kind of like, a, makes it kind of easier to understand than other types of Lagrangian distance, which are slightly more, more obscure, in my opinion. There's lots of nice theory behind this, which makes, again, makes it desirable. So, you know, it, this actually is a metric, um, we have GD6, we have a Romanian structure, which I'll touch on later. And there's sort of nice theoretical and characterizing properties. So we know things like, you know, there, when there exists uh, a map T, um, we can characterize this T um, okay, under, under appropriate conditions. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I thought there was going to be a slide in between this, which kind of led to the disadvantage. Let me just check if there is. Okay, I, I unfortunately seem to have cut the disadvantages off, but let, so let me sort of do this um, ad lib. There's potentially two disadvantages to this type of distance. The first is actually it's quite slow to compute numerically because defining this, this T is, um, you know, it's an optimization problem. Although it's convex, it's actually not so not so easy. Well, it's convex in an, an appropriate formulation. The second thing is that we have a lot of sort of off-the-shelf data analysis tools. So I'm thinking of things like principal component analysis, linear discriminant analysis, um, but these are all for Euclidean distances. The question is, well, how can we do this in the sort of Wasserstein topology? And this, of course, is much much harder. So what I want to talk about now is kind of um, how to linearize these distances. So the point of linearizing these distances is essentially to find an embedding so that the Euclidean distance in the embedded space is approximately equal to the Wasserstein distance in the original space. So how you can kind of think of this is, you think of this as, okay, we, you know, we start off in, on this Wasserstein manifold. Okay, so this is some sort of, you know, curved space. 
So here we have you know, three measures, mu, mu1, and mu2. And then we have the Wasserstein distance, which is just the length of this curve along the manifold um, between mu and mu1. Okay, and so the green curve is the Wasserstein distance between mu1 and mu2. Okay, and likewise for the, for the blue. What we can do is we can project onto the tangent space. So the tangent space is down here. And the idea is, so mu is projected to this I0 tilde, mu1 is projected to I1 tilde, uh, mu2 is to I, um, I2 tilde. And the idea now is that if we do this projection, well, the length of this red curve here in the Wasserstein space is exactly equal to the Euclidean distance in the tangent space. Similarly for the blue curve here, so the blue curve here is exactly equal to the, um, the blue line here. And then kind of approximately, we expect that the green curve here is going to be equal to the green outline here. And this sort of depends on how curved the space is, but it's kind of an approximation we can make. Okay, so more precisely, kind of, you know, the, the Wasserstein distance between a measure mu and nu is actually equal to the Euclidean distance, okay, which is given by this L2 norm, um, of the logarithmic map, which is just a projection into the tangent uh, plane. Okay, so this kind of allows us to kind of define a linear Wasserstein distance. Okay, so the linear Wasserstein distance is just the distance between the, the two, um, between the, the distance in the tangent space, essentially. Okay, and the kind of, you know, the approximation is that if we take uh, two arbitrary measures, mu1 and mu2, then this should be approximately equal to the um, linear Wasserstein distance um, at some center mu. Right, so th this approximation here is just saying that this green curve here should be approximately equal to this green line here. Okay, so this framework now allows us to do things in Euclidean spaces, and so this is kind of one little example of how we can generate new images um, in using the Wasserstein topology. Okay, so you know, we start off with a data set of images. So first thing is we're going to do is we're going to try and approximate this manifold at k uh, at k points. Okay, so we have n images. So we do this linear embedding around um, some point, and then this now gives us you know uh, a big sort of uh, well a lot of vectors in some some Euclidean space, and then we do something like k means. Right, so k-means now gives us our k uh, points at which we can uh, try and approximate this manifold. Then we do the same thing. So at each of these sort of k-centers, we look to linearize again around these points here. And now what we do is we fit a Gaussian to it. So okay, so here we can imagine is our, um, our linearization around this, okay, the, the second data, well, the second cluster center here. Now, okay, if we want to generate a new image, what we do is, you know, first of all, we, we sample one of these, uh, these cluster centers. Then we can sample a point in the, in the linear space. And then this, this whole process is reversible. So we can go back and we can generate a new image. So I think a question whenever you're looking at the data generation is, are you really generating new images or are you just sort of pushing back what you, what you had before. So we did this with a very, very, very small number of um, images. So we did this with a data set of just 19 images. So the top row here are the images which we used. And then the second two rows, these are the generated images. And what you can kind of see is that actually, you know, none of these faces here appear exactly in the top row. So we are generating new images. I mean, of course, it's not perfect, right? You can see just around here, you know, the, the mouse is, is kind of messed up, but we're also only learning from 19 images, right? I mean, it's, it's a difficult, um, difficult problem. Okay, I can give you sort of an example of like a, a sort of a toy problem. Um, okay, so this is a data set, obviously synthetic, and it has sort of two modes of variation. So one mode of variation, which actually isn't so clear on these pictures, is that one of these sort of ellipses has more mass than the other, and it changes from one end to the other end. Um, so I, I can't remember now which one it is, because uh, it's, it's not so clear actually. Um, the other mode of variation is the orientation of the ellipses. So you can see here, you know, it's neg on its side, here it's standing up. Um, you can kind of just ignore the, um, these are two different types of optimal transport distance. This is the Wasserstein, uh, okay, it's the Wasserstein center. This is a slightly modified version um, known as the Hellinger-Kantorovich distance. Okay, and we can 
from this, we can look at, um, so okay, so you know, we, we do our linear embedding, and then we can look at what are the modes of variation in this data set. So let's focus on the, the HK embedding. What we find is that there are two few PCA. This corresponds to two modes, the, the first two principal components corresponds to two types of um, deformations. So the first uh, principal component corresponds to stretching the, the top ellipse and sort of squashing the bottom ellipse. Right? And that's exactly kind of what one of the modes of variation was in the data set. Um, the second mode of variation corresponds to enlarging the first um, um, ellipse and shrinking the second ellipse. So again, this is exactly what's, what we get. So it's kind of nice, right, that this, um, that we've kind of really captured the geometry. Even though it's a synthetic data set, we've kind of managed to find it. And of course, the Euclidean distance wouldn't capture this sort of uh, thing. So we, we applied this to the problem of uh, tagging um, tagging jets from, again, so this is actually from a simulated data set of particle collider events, but it's meant to be fairly realistic. So we're given sort of QCD jets and W boson jets. And so the, um, if you just focus on the sort of green uh, dots, right, this is, so somehow that this, this is meant to represent the, the back plate. Um, and then, you know, we have particles hitting the back plate. And then the idea is, okay, what, what um, reaction did, did these particles come from? Okay, so we have, you know, so the um, QCD jets, so typically you get sort of like one uh, big particle in the middle and then sort of other parts, smaller particles around them. In the W boson jets, you typically see sort of two big jets in the middle and then surrounded by sort of smaller particles. So again, we can do sort of linear embedding space, uh, it's just linear embedding, and then we can sort of look at the geometry. And again, it kind of tells you something about what's sort of going on. So what you can sort of see here is that, um, sorry, it's a bit which way around it is. So I think the brown here is two. So the, okay, so the brown, it corresponds to the W boson jets. So you can sort of see that we do get, you know, the W boson jets are kind of accumulating around here and the QC jets are accumulating around here. So you see, you also get some um, uh, of the, I forgot which way around it is again, of the, uh, the W boson jets over here. But actually, if you look at that, so even though, so six is a W boson jet, um, but actually it does kind of look more like a QCD jet because it is kind of, uh, it, there is only kind of one, one um, particle. So it's kind of reasonable that our sort of algorithm would sort of struggle to distinguish um, that from the, from the um, other uh, QCD jets. Okay, so now we, once we're in this linear space, you know, we can apply sort of off-the-shelf tools like linear discriminant analysis, k-nearest neighbors, support vector machines. Um, okay, and so, of course, you know, we, we get to the fairly reasonable results. So the, these are length scales, which I haven't really introduced, but since we can kind of control how far the, this transport happens. Okay, so I'll just sort of summarize um, very quickly. So in part one, we, we looked at how to scale graphs in order to achieve sort of asymptotic wall posedness. And we found that there were regimes where the problem is it's ill posed. And then we kind of proposed those two solutions. So one is to just increase the number of labels and we can find a minimal number of labels on these. And the second is to try and correct the bias. And this led to kind of a new method, which is very good um, at lower label rates. In the second, Part we looked at linearizing this optimal transport framework, and this was to allow for off the shelf data analysis tools in this sort of better geometry. Okay, and we've looked at sort of several examples, so um, uh, including sort of uh, data generation and, uh, and jet tagging, and we're looking at sort of more interesting, well, other applications, um, including sort of designing fingerprints for material sciences and sort of medical imaging. So these kind of parts are more in progress. So with that, uh, thank you very much. And yeah, any, any questions? Um, thank you very much, Matt, for a very interesting talk. We have uh, actually three minutes for questions and uh, the floor is open. Any questions? 
Okay, um, I'll, <laughs> I'll ask a question again. Uh, so a bit outside my area, but somehow you mentioned um, on your um, image generation, you mentioned that you had, um, I mean, I was just wondering about the scalability of your, uh, yeah, when that, the, the, well, the previous one, when you're generating images. So um, you mentioned that, um, uh, you know, uh, about learning your images and you had only a small amount of original images to generate and some of them, the look, you know, the generation looks quite different. So, um, I mean, you, what is the impact if you had, uh, I mean, did you try it on a largest data set to see how this would be different if you have uh, uh, more images to learn from? Yes, that's a good question. So I guess maybe there's two ways to answer this. So I guess the first thing actually um, is one of the reasons for doing this, this sort of linear embedding actually is precisely so you can deal with bigger data sets. So one problem, if you wanted to do, say you, can, you wanted to do everything in the Wasserstein space, and then you wanted to compute all pairwise distances, say, that's very expensive, right? This is n squared times, you know, however long it takes to compute a Wasserstein distance, which can be, you know, fairly significant. Um, on the other hand, this sort of linear embedding space, you have to do the embedding, which is essentially equivalent to computing the um, Wasserstein distance sort of once. So this means you have to do it sort of n times for, you know, a data set size n, and then you do everything in Euclidean space. After that, everything is kind of very quick. Um, so of course you can't go to arbitrarily big data sets still because you know it is still expensive to compute each embedding, but it, you can go much bigger um, than you can do just doing this in the Wasserstein space. So I guess that's that's one thing. But I guess you can also ask this: Well, do we get better results if we do for bigger data sets? Um, it's a good question, actually. I'm not sure if we, okay, this paper was from 2018. I can't remember now which experiments went in it. I think we do have more experiments, but I can't remember now if we have um, kind of like a large scale um, experiment. I would certainly expect to do better because essentially, you know, we're, we're trying to learn these tangent planes here. And so of course, the more data you get, kind of the better you kind of approximate these. Um, so these tangent planes are all kind of, you know, they're, estimated using a, a Gaussian. So of course one expects better results if you get um, get more data, but I don't actually remember if we did that experiment or not. That's okay. We have, I know it's three o'clock, uh, but you have a, a couple of interesting questions. So the first one was, if there were any disadvantages to a Poisson learning, actually that's a good question. I, <laughs> I wanted to know too, <laughs> yeah. Um, so we didn't really test this when you get high label rates. So this could be one, um, so I, I don't know, so this may not be a disadvantage, may not be an advantage. What we kind of notice is that the, the, the gain sort of dis disappears as you get to higher label rates, which is what we expect because we only corrected this bias in the low labeling rate regime. Is in terms of numerical sort of performance, like the, the, the original algorithm essentially is pretty quick, um, especially when the data set isn't too big because you have analytical or solutions for it. So, I mean, you have to invert a matrix, but essentially you don't need to do anything. You don't have to have any optimization algorithm. Um, for Poisson learning, it's not so simple, right? We actually have to do some sort of gradient descent. So, you know, potentially it's a bit slower there, but we find it's not, not too bad. Um, Okay, and the last one, so people can leave if they want, is um, about the, the GNNs. This is from Julia. Uh, if you are looking at the impact of the graph structure on learning as well. I'm not 100% sure what the question means, actually. So in terms of uh, graph neural networks, again, we're kind of interested in this sort of semi-supervised learning regime. Well, we're interested in two things. Like one is, um, looking at deep graph neural networks. So this, so there's kind of, I guess, I would say a fair amount of excitement where um, this group, um, kind of a lot of the graph neural networks are sort of based around diffusion equations. And the problem with the diffusion equation is that it diffuses. So what you kind of, you have this sort of, um, over smoothing problem that as you go through your network, everything kind of becomes more and more constant and it kind of, no one's really 
you know, as far as I'm aware, being able to get sort of graph neural networks to work at very deep layers. So the idea is to kind of use some of these sort of insights from what happens in, you know, in past learning and Poisson learning to design sort of new sort of architectures which will work it for deep um, deep layers. Now I have to sort of admit, I guess, in machine learning, it's always deeper is better. Um, if you ask me to kind of justify that, I don't know if I, I could. Right, I'm getting on the on the bandwagon and going <laughs> going along with this, but um, oh. yeah. Um, okay, thanks very much. Actually, we're running a bit out of time, but I we started uh, at uh, past three, so we're exactly one hour. With that, uh, thank you very much to both our speakers for excellent talks. And um, please, um, be, uh, we have another series, the third in, in December, and we'll advertise that as well. So um, again, thank you very much for your time. Bye-bye. <laughs>